this is sort of a follow-up, a plugging in part two. And this is about uh, using metaphors to draw us in closer to God. So it's that practice of the presence of God. And how, um, how can we go about that in a more, maybe a more simplified way or a accessible way to us? Um, it's taking a, a different approach. So last week we talked about it and we sort of took more of an external approach where we made our list of those things which were triggers for us or helped us to, um, that we naturally felt closer to God with. And then I introduced the idea and started discussing how I really got to thinking about all of the metaphors in the Bible and, and why, why there are metaphors. And my hypothesis was that when you think about it, those metaphors are timeless. And because none of those things that were discussed have gone away. Think of how many things in our society now are fleeting or how are temporary or change within the moment even, like technology for example, how quickly it advances. And most things that we, are, that we make that are human made um, don't last for very long. But yet the, it's almost a miracle in itself that those metaphors that are in the Bible although they have a different context because they were in a different historical setting, they still have relevance and they're still present to us. And I'm just really excited because to me, it's like the key to unlock an unlimited treasure that before I was only mildly aware of. And I just kind of wondered why they were there. Now, I do want to caveat this lesson by telling you that once again, um, I, when I watch the, the show The Chosen, I probably watch one episode every three or four months because I, don't, I want it to be, um, I want to be in the sweet spot. I want to be, to, to watch it when I'm in the right place, spiritually, emotionally, um, and also, I don't want to be overly influenced by it either. So it's sort of an enhancement or a powering up, if you will. But I don't want to be so attached to that um, uh, interpretation that that becomes my understanding and reality of the Bible. And so I'm very careful about when I do watch an episode. And so I think maybe four months have gone by, and I finally, when I was camping, decided, okay, I'm going to watch the next episode. And wouldn't you know, it was about the Sermon on the Mount, and it specifically addressed the metaphors <laughs> in the Bible. And I thought, oh my gosh, th again, they're going to think I'm taking my ideas from the show, but I promise you that it's coming after I give one of my presentations. So of course, it's not by coincidence, as you know. And um, it only served to, that bit, that nugget, served to open up my eyes more. And it was um, one scene in particular that, uh, uh, and that came to me after this, the, after I constructed this um, lesson too. But Matthew would, asked, you know, Jesus, why, why so many metaphors? And the way they present Matthew is he's a little bit on the spectrum in the show. He's kind of Asperger-ish, and he says, I don't get metaphors, so, you know, why, why not just tell us? And, of course, um, the response, you know, from Jesus was, because I want people to be passionate about this journey. I want them to be um, not just passive, but passionate about it, engaged in it, searching. And so if it's a metaphor, then you have to be looking and you have to be aware and you have to be cultivating your understanding. I'm, I'm saying all of that. And so I thought, well, that's very reinforcing to where my mind has been in these last couple weeks. So today's lesson, instead of taking the approach where we make our list, and then we try to remind ourselves of that list as we go through our day in an effort to practice the presence of God in our lives, in our moment-to-moment -moment lives. Now it's a different, it's the inside out. So just like Tai Chi, we learn it externally, we learn the forms, and then at some point it becomes more of an internal process and what's happening inside is far more important than what is seen on the outside. Oh my gosh, I mean, that is the Bible. 
the more you journey with the Bible, the more you, your eyes are opened, and the more you hear, the more you see, the more you can walk that, that path, then the more it becomes an internal process. And the external is, is just the superficial. And you're starting to you know, see between the lines, so to speak, and understand the metaphors, but not just understanding them from a cognitive level. That's what I want today is for you all to experience the presence of God with you. And I think one of the main barriers that we have is that these words are used over and over again and sometimes used like a sledgehammer. And so they automatically set up a barrier. You know, like, uh, I, as you well know, I have a hang-up with the word mindfulness. Now, that's not necessarily a Christian term, but it's been used so much and in so many different connotations that it just kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And so I immediately have resistance when I hear somebody say mindfulness. But that doesn't mean it's not a valid word and that, that the inside, the inner meaning of it isn't true. Um, but for me, I have to find a different word. So, you know, we talked about, I talked about even Jesus, the name Jesus. It's a, it's a name from a different time, and it's been used, you know, so many different ways, and sometimes with, um, you know, a hardness that a lot of people shut down right with that word. And so, you know, calling him something else might, in my mind, might make me feel closer and let bar less barriers. And so I think that having metaphors in the Bible that are just every ordinary things, I mean, our feet are part of us, and the rainbow, and the tree, and the water, and there are hundreds and hundreds of more, that those are opportunities for us for it to become an internal process. And rather than turning to our list and saying, okay, now what was I supposed to do when I'm washing my feet? that it happens the other way around, that you become familiar with the metaphors so that it comes to you in the day. And then in that moment, you have that presence with God. And it starts to happen even more and more as you go through that process. And so I think that's sort of what happened to me this weekend and what I really wanted to share with you, that. Before, I was having to um, be mindful of it. And by retreating away from most of the world's pressures and demands and my own environment, uh, going to this environment of nature, it allowed me to kind of unravel and be in a place where now these things started to flow and come to me. And when I noticed one, and then it sort of uh, like fuel injection, you know, it sort of gave me a, a, a jolt and awareness to recognize another and another and another. And so I want to talk about those and then we'll have a discussion. I want to hear if you have this week, if you practiced it a little bit, what that was like, what some of the metaphors you came up with, and then um, <clears throat> how to proceed forward so that this becomes an internal to external experience. Now, I'm gonna start with um, another quote, or a quote from Brother Lawrence that I quoted last week, but now in looking at it, it has even more relevance to me. The most holy and necessary practice in our spiritual life is the presence of God. That means finding constant pleasure in His divine company, speaking humbly and lovingly with Him in all seasons, at every moment, without limiting the conversation in any way. Now, wouldn't that be a lovely experience to be able to capture that and have that into your life, your every moment. <clears throat> and at first it seems pretty daunting. Uh, and it's like we, you know, trying to establish a habit can be daunting. And we, you know, we try to do all sorts of things like rubber band around our wrist or, or whatever to jolt us back into, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be doing this. But that's not the way that it's meant to be approached. 
you know, here is the scripture that ties so very much into what Brother Lawrence is saying. He probably was inspired by this very scripture. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. And I, I think the word delight, I mean, is so separate from a lot of um, expressions of Christianity and a lot of expressions of of religion or of communing with God. I mean, that word delight is, it's so important and an essence that oftentimes is either overlooked or just not present. But here it's commanding us, it's telling us to rejoice always and delight in your faith. And it's not even identifying your faith, like a lot of faith, a little bit of faith, the faith of a mustard seed, just delight in your faith, no matter what it is at that time and place and moment. Be unceasing and persisting, persistent in prayer. And that sentence there is the one that I found to be um, at first daunting and, and challenging. How, how can one be unceasing and persistent in prayer when we have so many things to do? <laughs> and granted, those are our human um, demands and all of the worldly distractions. So how does one become unceasing and persistent in prayer? And that's what this lesson is hopefully about. It's about giving you tools to recognize th that, of course, as you know, prayer can be come in many forms, but how do we bring that into our lives into an unceasing and persistent aspect? In every situation, uh, not only the situations in which we're in the season of darkness or the season of fear or anguish, but also in the season of happiness and of joy and when everything's going great. Be thankful and continually give thanks to God. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, and this is actually just the stock photo that came with the template of uh, the, mm, this app. But yet, it's great because here's this little child with a pile of whatever rocks in her hand, and yet she's delighting and rejoicing. And I think that's how it's supposed to feel to us. That's how it's supposed to feel. It's like finding things. All of, It's like a grand Easter egg hunt. And we keep finding all these different Easter eggs and we pop them open to see what's in side. And that's what the, that these metaphors are. It's like a grand Easter egg hunt. And we find a metaphor and we're like, pop it open to say, what, oh, what does this one mean? What is, what's that? And listen and hear and, and receive and delight in it. And it becomes a more... Um, persistent style of prayer because it's like God just keeps dropping all of these Easter eggs in front of us. Boop, 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 boop. And sometimes we're so distracted we step on it and crush it and we don't even notice it. And sometimes we see it. So the goal here is to see more of those Easter eggs popped in front of us and be able to open it up and rejoice in it and feel thankful and feel delight because it's like your best friend who you heard and heard from in years gives you a call. I mean, how delighted are you at that? And you're energized by it. And that could happen in so many moments in our day. Can you imagine how you would feel if God did just speak your name? And again, would you have the wherewithal to say, here I am? And then the second part of that is he says, I am here. But now we're moving into the part where we say, I am here. And when we say, I am here, then he says, I am here, and we're both, I am here. And that's being present in the moment. It's not just being, pre that phrase, be present in the moment, is empty. It's not just being present in the moment, it's being present in the moment with God. Then it's, I am here. And he is, I am here. And we are here in this moment together. 
So opening our eyes, being aware of the metaphors that are in the Bible and allowing that to be the tool for us to realize that we're being communicated with in so many ways and we're missing so many. So if we're alert to it, then we don't have to work as hard to be unceas unceasing or persistent in our prayer because now the opportunities are being presented to us to join in that communion rather than us having to go and seek the, the door to open. I mean, honestly, I was joking about that closet, but that was it. That was a perfect example of it right there. We can either, we saw her closet door, she had it open, and then she said, oh, let me close that closet door. She turned, she pushed that door closed and then turned around to face us and the other door popped open and she didn't see it. And that's kind of like this whole, this journey. How many things pop open in front of us and we don't see it because we're turned, we're turned around and we're focused on what, what's going to happen next and that we have to attend to. I'm not, I'm not saying, bla blazing uh, any judgment on that moment. I would have done the same thing. But that closing, I turned it into the metaphor, you know, the old saying, oh, you close one door, another one opens. Well, yeah, but we have to know, we have to see that God has opened up a different door for us. And there, right there, is a metaphor that we can use, and that is being present in the moment with God. Like, He's giving us all these little signs all the time, and we're not always seeing them. So... Rejoice and always delight in your faith because the expression of faith is tuning in, is one way of it, is tuning into these metaphors and believing in them, believing that this is God talking to you or that you are communing with God and that that is a form of prayer. That's faith. And delighting in it is what's so very important. So I'm going to take you through a few of these metaphors that presented themselves to me this morning, this weekend. And it was like I saw one and then it just, like I said, it added fuel for me to see more and more and more. So um, this morning, <laughs> I this is a kind of a funny story, but I have a bathroom that's a, a walkthrough bathroom. So it has two doors, one on each end. And so when you, it's the guest bathroom, so you have to make sure that both doors are closed, of course, when you use that restroom. And that happens to be the restroom I use in the morning. And my dogs feel like they must be with me when I use, go to the restroom in the morning. And so it's like a parade into the restroom. Well, I have this door, which is into the main living room from which I'm coming. And then there's this other door way around on the other side, through the kitchen, around the living room, through the hallway, and then into the restroom. And for whatever reason, the dogs tend to take the door that's furthest away rather than the one that's closest. And I consider my dogs pretty smart, but why is it that they never take the door that's closest? And that made me see it as a metaphor to how I think we approach our communion with God and with Jesus so many times. We don't even notice or we're so conditioned to take the door that's furthest away to become close to Him that we don't realize that there's a much shorter door, a much easier path, just a few steps away that's another option. You know, both of them work, but one of them is arduous, longer path. You know, we've got to, got to find our way to it. But maybe there's a shorter door that we can go through that's easier to, to feel closer to God. So you can take the door on top. We're already on the second floor. We can just walk right in and feel His love and feel that... Mm, that relationship with him or we can do the long route around and feel like we've got to have so many rituals in place or so we have to get rid of all of our sin or we have to get rid of all of our baggage or we have to have the you know the metaphor of tai chi we have to have all our posture perfect before we can be into allowed in that door no it doesn't have to be that way we have the shorter path we have the shorter door to get there this bottom door, the Old Testament, follow all the laws 
uh, however many there are, 630 or whatever, or the New Testament, we can just believe in and have faith and walk in that door. So you see all that just from two doors being open in my morning ritual that I've done for 12 years in the same house didn't come to me until after I've had some other metaphors pass through today, uh, the last few days. This one was the one that kind of started it all for me and that was uh, while camping my first night and we had a full moon might be just slightly of less than a full moon. And it's my first time camping with a full moon. And it was cold, cold night, 39 degrees. So it was a crisp full moon. And I was inside my camper and I had all the windows closed and my heater on. And I thought, you know what? I need to go out there and see this. And I noticed, look, you know, I unzipped a little bit and I peered out and I saw the light and how different it looked and some the the shadows were being cast and that's I decided I've got to go out. Yes, it's cold out there, but I'm going to do this. So I bundled up and I went outside. And I looked up and I saw that moon and it was so brilliant and beautiful. And right then that put me in the place because it says I saw the light. <laughs> and then that light was casting those shadows and there was a light breeze and it was dancing on the ground. It was so beautiful. And then surprisingly, I could still see so many stars even though it was bright. And I saw a few stars and the stars looked so far away. And once again, I thought, you know, that's how it's honestly how it's felt to me for so long is in many ways is that He's out there and I'm over here. I'm down here. He's out there and far away and grand and omnipotent and all of those things that I know on a cognitive level. And I feel like I'm down here. And there's this huge separation. And um, that vastness made me feel smaller instead of more. Uh, it made me feel smaller instead of I am here or here I am. I could say here I am, but the here I am was like that. And in that moment, I looked again, and the moon was so brilliant that it was shining on the leaves. Now this is dark, you know, it's, it's 12 o'clock at night. The leaves on the tree that were between me and the sky, on the very tips of the leaves, the moonlight was reflecting. And it looked like hundreds of little stars on the tips of the tree leaves. And so it was as though God said to me, we're not that far apart. Here, I'm sending you some stars closer to you. <clears throat> and I felt just so in awe and so blessed. And I felt as though he was reaching towards me. And then I reached towards him and I started to have even more insight. I felt like there was this matrix or fabric woven and all those stars were now coming down and, and they had the stars and the leaves and then there were stars inside of me, light inside of me. And, and then I remembered reading recently that they're now discovering that every cell in our body is actually activated and driven by light. There's a whole new science coming up that cells are, have light in them. So every single cell in my body is like the stars up in the sky and the stars that were in between on the tree. And that all just became intermeshed. And so now there was a oneness there that, that made me feel connected. And boy, could I delight in that? Yes. Is that a form of prayer? Yes. And was that something that I could feel and think about. Every time I thought about it, wasn't that practice of the presence of God? Yes. And it was just a matter of making that first step outside, out into the cold, and then being embraced. You know, I kind of liken it to the difference between um, looking at a painting and being in the painting. So it's, uh, if any of you have gone to that um, immersive Van Gogh, or you've seen the imageries of the immersive Van Gogh, 
You know, you can look at the painting, Van Gogh painting, and it's one dimensional because you're looking at a flat surface, but then the immersive one. So what if our faith is to be immersive, if it's supposed to be like that? And then it went even more from there. If every cell in my body is like every star in the sky and, and the stars in between that God had sent down onto those leaves and it all became a three-dimensional oneness, then what if every single human being on the face of this earth is also like a cell? If I have seven trillion cells in my body, what if every single person on the faith of the earth, seven trillion people are seven trillion cells? And somehow, and isn't this possible because God can do the impossible, that every, all of us are like one big huge organism. And it's God's organism. And maybe there's a cell that dies. And we don't understand it. But it all is working somehow together to make this interwoven immersive thing that we don't even really have the capacity to understand. And so one trigger created an opportunity for me to have a metaphor that was physical, tangible to me, but yet I could expand on it, to have that practice of the presence of God. So this is wheat. And the next thing that happened, so I was already kind of primed, as you, you know, and the next morning I got up and, and my goal, my single goal was to, you know, be able to have more moments with God, more moments in the practice of the presence of God, and less moments where I'm pulled away and distracted by outside world, but maybe I could use the outside world to trigger some metaphors that would bring me back into the scripture and back into communion and relationship with God. And so I was noticing as Maestro was eating his food, <laughs> I had gotten him some new food and I, um, you know, in order to kind of uh, ease him into the new food, I had mixed his old food with the new food, dry food. Well, when you know it, this huge big standard poodle is picking through the food with his soft lips, and I noticed that he was actually taking out the old food and leaving it on the ground and only eating the good food. Now, how he was able to do this is beyond me because they looked almost identical, except the new food was round and the old food was triangle. But they're same color, same texture, everything. And yet he was doing that. So I thought, okay, well, I don't know. I picked up his bowl and I started to separate it for him. <laughs> and I thought, this is so silly, I'm, I'm really spoiling this dog. But then so a calmness came over me, and the metaphor came of separating the chaff, the wheat from the chaff. And here's a metaphor in the Bible. And um, it made me think about that, and what that was like, and how careful and precise, and without error, God will be in that process, or is in that process. And so as I was separating it, I became more calm, and for every one that I separated it, it I felt, I just felt that, that humbleness, that lovingness, and as though I was a part of a process that was beyond my understanding and it was okay, but somehow it was bringing me closer to, it was making, the, the words of the Bible come to life for me. And I was separating dog food. <laughs> and so after I did his bowl, I thought, oh, what the heck, I'm just going to do the whole bag because I felt so peaceful. And, it, and so I did. I started separating out the whole bag and throughout it I felt like I had thoughts coming in that weren't really my own, that God was talking to me and encouraging me and giving me more metaphors, more signs. And one of them was, as I went through, you know, that, that there will not be one, and I know that term is also overused, but there will not be one single one left behind. So I was meticulous and careful, but not, not urgent. I was peaceful about it. And then, even as I was going through it, another thought came to my mind, that even the broken ones will be saved. And really, m most of those should have been broken because I think all of us are broken in some way or another, right? 
So even the smallest little morsel that was just a broken piece, I was careful to get it separated out of the, of the, the food that, that Meister liked, the good food, so to speak. And then I was, as the light started to change, it became more challenging. And I tipped the bowl just a little bit, and the sunlight hit it. And then, the, you know, the message that came through is, everything's so much easier in the light. Stay in the light. So many metaphors just coming in so easily, practicing the presence of God through metaphor. That's why there's, that's one of the reasons why. There's probably other reasons I don't, un, I don't know, but that's one of the reasons why there are metaphors in the Bible. And I think that we need to use, we need to become aware of them so that we can recognize them in our day and use those as our, our tool, as the key to open up the treasure box so that we can practice the presence of God without it being an arduous task, without, without, with it becoming um, a joyful, delightful, let's find the next Easter egg and see what's inside it. So, I don't know, I was, this picture just, I found this one and, and it, to me, kind of spoke to the, the light, you know, and, um, I think, I haven't quite figured this one out, actually, but I'm wondering if it's not saying to, to shine the light in the right place so that we can be led and we can be, we know where to put our next step. And then this one happened this morning. So I feel like my eyes and my ears have been opened in a new way now. And rather than me making my list of, of, when I'm going to tap into God and, and, and making it an external process. It's now an internal process so that I'm just more aware and these things come more readily to me. And my, my husband was actually just full of, of metaphorical statements this morning and he did not even realize it. I wasn't pointing it out, but I was kind of chuckling inside that like he was being used as the instrument to talk to me today. And so um, I was still in the camping mode, right? And it was kind of cold this morning, so I started the fire in the fireplace, and uh, this is not a picture of my fireplace, but you can imagine. And he said, uh, he thought I had changed the flame on it, it's gas, and I said, no, I haven't changed it. He said, it was bigger when it was dark. So we had the lights turned off, and the fire appeared bigger. There was more light, it appeared like more, there was more. And then once we started getting about our day and turn on the lights and then it didn't look as big. And so he said, did you turn the fireplace down? I said, no. And he said, oh, it was bigger when it was dark. I thought, oh, there's a metaphor. And that's what it should be like for us. That in our darkest moments is when that light is the brightest for us. That the light of God becomes even brighter when we're in the season of darkness, when we're having, and, and that's faith. That's when it's the biggest challenge for us. And it's easy to have faith and when things are going great, but when things are not going great or when things, challenges come our way or sadness or lack of understanding of what's happening to us or other people or our environment or the world, well, if we could somehow just remind ourselves that the light is bigger in the darkness. Yeah, I, there was one other one that I had happen to me. I was, so, it, it, and it's interesting because it kind of went, the, the unraveling of each of these went from grand, I mean huge, looking out at that sky and those stars and the infiniteness of that. And then as I went through this journey, it kind of came down to a smaller scale any smaller scale and a smaller scale, which sort of taught me uh, to look far and wide. And uh, so I went over, I was brushing my teeth next to a tree, <laughs> brush my teeth, and I saw a little teeny tiny piece of the bark on the tree start to move. <laughs> and I mean, I'm telling you, this thing was three millimeters by three millimeters. And the, the bark had a little bit of uh, that, that uh, 
grayish green fungi on it that kind of grows on it. And this was part of that, it looked just like that. And it was moving. And I thought, well, maybe it was a vibration for my tooth, you know, that I was seeing the bark move. And so I stopped my toothbrush rather, and I stopped my toothbrush and I looked and it was still moving. And then I just got drawn in and it was some strange bug that I never could see the underside. I never could see legs or eyes or head, but it was some sort of strange bug. And its whole journey was probably at most a half an inch. So its entire world was right there, moving around that little piece of bark that it completely camouflaged and matched. And I don't know what it was doing, but whatever it was doing, it was doing it for its own survival. And it was part of its own world, its own ecosystem, its own expression of life. And it was mystery, it was mysterious because it's something I'd never seen before. And it was fascinating. And so I, I just watched that little bug move around a little bit, little bit, little bit, until he kind of buried into the nook of the bark. And then I think he sort of just disappeared and settled there. And, you know, that was the end of my journey with it. But I felt connected. I felt like the presence of God. I felt like I was being shown that how how God can work in this vast hugeness and in this that there's a whole nother world going on that we're not aware of unless we tune in that was like this big was this little teeny tiny thing but yet and what was time to it was that a whole lifetime that I observed was was that the equivalent of five miles or a hundred miles or halfway around the world to that that God made creature that the perspectives are so different but yet both so real and that it made me reflective into myself and how when before I got so, got sick that I felt like I out, that life was out there and that I had to have adventurous sports and adventurous travel to feel satiated with life. And so I mountain biked, I windsurfed, I flew airplanes, I did all these big, huge things. And when I was in a place where I couldn't move, and I was in a chair, and, I, and the only thing that existed was looking outside my window, and I saw so many things I'd never noticed before. And I never n knew if I was ever going to be able to travel again or ever be able to, d to do these things again. And so I, I worked to try to find some peace and some observation in, in the closeness of things and realizing that there was an adventure going on right outside my window with all the various birds that came. To, I had a bird feeder, thank goodness, and all the variety of birds that came. And I started to see a rhythm and a society there and relationships there that I would have never have observed. And so I pretended or, you know, felt like that was my travel, that was my adventure. And that that could be as fulfilling. And then to see that little tiny bug, you know, the other day that matched the tree trunk that I would have never have seen before if I hadn't been dialed in, plugged in, and that the adventures are happening everywhere. Life is happening everywhere and expressions of life and even places that we can't see and even at a microscopic level that we haven't even been able to magnify yet. And it's endless. So I think that seeing that little bug was another metaphor that I couldn't even really put words to, but I had this sense of, of the two extremes, of the expansiveness and of the microcosmic level of life going on. And I felt tuned in. I felt connected. And it inspired me to find more of those Easter eggs, so to speak. You know, they, that's a terminology, I think, in Hollywood, that they put Easter egg, they call it an Easter egg, and they put it in movies. Did you know about that? So, or shows? And it's um, little special, little things are kind of hidden for those people who are really into the show and that they'll be able to notice or see the Easter egg or find the Easter egg. And I, uh, and I didn't know about that. I had heard about it and learned about it like many years later. 
And so maybe that's what it's kind of like. These little metaphors or these meta huge metaphors that God has given us in the Bible, those are our Easter eggs to find in life and to seek them. And then we have a deeper understanding. Like when they watch the show, the people that find the Easter eggs are supposed to be the ones that are like in the know, right? And so, you know, not, not that the goal, the goal is supposed to be in the know. The goal is to feel connected to God. But if we're more in the know, if we're more insightful, then that, that, it's like the chi flow in our body. We've got these kinks and they stop the flow. And so if we can start to open up those kinks and eliminate them, then we start to flow even more and more. And I think that's what it's like in our relationship with God. And using the metaphors to help us to undo some kinks, to have some insight that we haven't seen before, to feel some relationship so that it's not out there, that it's in here with us. What a fabulous thing. It's like a, like a, a huge Christmas present, you know, to find this, this key to that treasure trove of, of things that we can use to help us feel, practice the presence of God and have that relationship that He wants us to have with Him and to delight in it and to rejoice in it. Yeah, so I guess to summarize, I think that um, our goal is, you know, thinking of standing underneath those stars or how we approach our relationship with God is that I, I really believe that we are being called to make this more of an experiential uh, rather than an observational experience in our lives so that we should be practicing this relationship with God so that it is an experience, not an observation. And I feel like, honestly, I feel like when I was a child or younger that in the pureness of that state, maybe it was experiential for me. And then as life, you know, put on the different distractions and different paths and ways and things and that it became, I became unplugged and pulled out of that star system and moved more and more and more and more away and became more and more and more insulated. And then kind of, you, you know it's there, you can see it, but you feel separate from it. And that's not what it's supposed to be like. We're, we need to make it feel like it's a integral part of who we are and how we move through our day. And not that it's an arduous task, that it's a delightful experience, not an arduous observation. And one that we can actually rejoice in and feel some childlike exploration and excitement about the discovery. And so my lesson today is to hopefully like kind of inspire you and open your eyes to the tools that have been given us through, through the Bible, through the Word of God. And there's no coincidence that there are so many timeless metaphors and that maybe that's a tool that we're being given, that we're being urged to utilize and recognize in our day so that we can, so that this, this can be, this relationship can be more of an experience to us rather than just an observation or a ritual. So metaphors, they help us to see, to hear, and to experience. All right, so here's our prayer. Dear Lord, allow me to relinquish so that nothing else matters other than remaining lovingly united to you and your will. Open my eyes, heart, and mind so I may remain continuously in your presence. A quiet, familiar conversation ongoing with you.